Hi, today we're going to be looking at fermentation, which is one of the ways in which microorganisms are able to get harnessed energy from carbon sources. Fermenters are going to be used in multiple different procedures. We use them in biotechnology for antibiotic, vitamin, and amino acid production. We use them in agriculture, in garden and farm composting, sewage treatment plants, as well as the processing of garbage in garbage landfills. We also use them in food industry, as in the food preservation, as well as the production of food and drinks. Now, when we look at the energy conservation options for chemo organotrophs, microorganisms can either use respiration or fermentation. If they use respiration, they are going to produce ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. If they're going to ferment, they're going to use substrate level phosphorylation. Now, during respiration, you have the reduction of an exogenous electron acceptor, for example, oxygen, or some other kind of electron acceptor from the outside that is going to be used in an electron transport chain to receive electrons. During substrate level phosphorylation, you're going to have the reduction of a compound that was derived from the electron donor, and there is not going to be an exogenous electron acceptor. Now, in substrate level phosphorylation, as I mentioned, ATP is made directly from what is known as an energy-rich intermediate during the catabolic steps that are going to allow for the fermentation of a compound. So for example, if we have a substrate A that eventually is going to be metabolized to a product D, you can have an intermediate B, which is going to be phosphorylated, that is going to generate an energy-rich intermediate through the reactions that intermediate phosphorylated B is going to be converted to a phosphorylated C. And now the bond between the phosphate and the intermediate C can be broken to generate an ATP molecule. That is the term of substrate level phosphorylation. And you have learned about that before in the process of glycolysis. That is how ATP is generated in glycolysis. Now, on the other hand, oxidative phosphorylation requires the production of a proton motile force. And the proton motile force is going to be used by the cell to produce ATP using the enzyme ATP synthase. The proton gradient 4 also is going to energize the membrane. And when ATP is generated by moving protons from a higher concentration in the outside to a lower concentration in the inside, that is going to dissipate the proton motile force during ATP synthesis and result in a membrane that is less energized. So during oxidative phosphorylation, the cell is constantly pumping protons in the outside to continue having an energized membrane and maintaining a proton motile force. So in both the synthesis of ATP, in respiration and fermentation, we're going to have energy release in redox reactions. And over here, to have a better idea and more information about substrate phosphorylation, I am giving you a um, address from the E. coli student portal from UCLA. So you can look at your leisure and get more information about substrate level phosphorylation. Now, I want you to make sure that you review chapter three, section uh, 3.6. And you can think of redox reactions as a pair of half reactions. One in which you're going to have a molecule donating an electron and the other one you're going to have a molecule accepting the electron. So in this case, we're going to look at the donation of electrons from hydrogen and the acceptance of those electrons by oxygen. So in the initial half reaction, hydrogen donates those electrons to produce two electrons and two protons. In the other half reaction, an oxygen molecule is going to accept those two electrons and become an oxygen anion. Together, those two protons and that anion are going to form a water molecule. Once you write it down as a complete net reaction, what you see is a hydrogen molecule, which is going to be oxidized and donate electrons to an oxygen atom, which is going to be reduced and accept those electrons to form water. Now, when we're looking at the donation of electrons and the acceptance of electrons, we can organize redox pairs in an electron tower. And that tower is usually organized as redox couples. As you learn in Bio 110, molecules that are have uh, E naught, which is termed the redox potential, that redox potential could be negative or can be positive. 
the strongest reductants are going to have a negative uh, redox potential and the strongest oxidants are going to have a positive electron potential. So for example, hydrogen has a great tendency to donate electrons better than protons do to accept the electrons. So you can look, for example, at the electrons donated by hydrogen in the reactions, either hydrogen donating electrons to fumarate to generate succinate, and that gives you a delta G naught of minus 86 kilojoules. You can look at the reaction of hydrogen donating electrons to nitrate, and uh, producing nitrite and water, and that has a delta G of minus 163 kilo kilojoules. Or you can look at the electrons donated um, from hydrogen to oxygen to generate water with a delta G of 237 kilojoules. So what you can appreciate from those two reactions is that the greater the distance between the electron donor and the electron acceptors in the redox tower, the more amount of energy you're going to be able to generate as measured by delta G naught. So this is one of the indications that we have a really good relationship between the difference in redox potential to the amount of energy that you can get from a redox reaction. So the greater the distance between the electron donor and electron acceptor, the greater the amount of energy that you're going to generate. As you know, NAD plus is one of the electron carriers that is going to be used in the cell to transfer electrons from one enzyme complex to another. And in this particular example, what you're having is redox reactions that are going to help generate NAD plus and NADH. NADH is the reduced form of NAD+. So when you have NAD+, that is going to be bound by an enzyme, it's going to, that enzyme also is going to bind an electron donor, shown here by the pink molecule. Now you're going to have the generation of the uh, reaction where the enzyme will catalyze the transfer of electrons from the substrate to NAD+. That will generate NADH and the product. Now, NADH is able to go to a different enzyme complex, so shown here as enzyme 2, and bind to that enzyme, and is able to donate the electrons to another substrate. Here's going to be this little green molecule that is going to be the electron acceptor. So now the new enzyme, enzyme 2, is going to mediate the transfer of electrons from NADH to the substrate, generating a reduced substrate product, as well as recycling now NAD+, that could be used again by enzyme 1. So what we're going to look is that in order for the energy conservation to happen, we're always going to require to have an exogenous electron donor in respiration. It could be, for example, oxygen, or it could be another molecule. But in fermentation, you're going to have the reductions derived from the original electron donor. So let's take a look at fermentation. Fermentation, we can consider it the incomplete oxidation of an organic compound under anaerobic condition. You're not going to have oxygen or another exogenous electron acceptor to, re to accept those electrons during reactions. So where is fermentation happening? It's happening in usually anaerobic environments. The sediments in lakes, swamps and bogs, waterlogged soils at the bottom of the ocean, inside are the human or other animals' guts, and in decaying plant and animal matter. So usually, when you look at microorganisms in culture, those which are growing away from oxygen, like the strict anaerobes, are most likely going to grow by fermentation. Facultative anaerobes are going to ferment in the absence of oxygen, and aerotolerant anaerobes are going to be fermenting all the time, even in the presence of oxygen. So all of those microorganisms are going to be potential fermenters. So let's take an example of E. coli. And E. coli, as you know, is going to be a microorganism that is able to transfer glucose across its membrane using its PTS system. And glucose transported across the membrane by this system is going to come inside the cell immediately phosphorylated. So it's going to enter the cell as glucose 6-phosphate. Now, that glucose 6-phosphate is going to go through the ebner meyerhoff parnas pathway, which you also know as glycolysis. At the beginning, um, that glucose molecule is going to go to the preparatory reactions. 
since it was transported by the PTS system, is already entering in step number two, which is glucose 6-phosphate. Eventually, it's going to be converted into fructose 6-phosphate, and another ATP is going to be used now to phosphorylate fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1-6-bisphosphate. Now, by the... Um, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, it's going to be broken down by the enzyme aldolase into two molecules, glutaraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. The triose phosphate isomerase enzyme will now convert the dihydroacetone phosphate into glutaraldehyde 3-phosphate. This is the step in which now NADH will be formed during glycolysis, when you have glutaraldehyde 3-phosphate that is going to uh, be phosphorylated from two protons to generate 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, and there two NADH molecules will be produced. Eventually, from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, you're going to have, through four reactions, the generation of four ATPs and two pyruvate molecules. Since we in, used two ATPs in the reaction and we generated four ATP during glycolysis, we're going to have a net reaction of two ATPs. Now, in respiration, the NADH generated from oxidation of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate will be regenerated during the Krebs cycle. But if in the absence of respiration, these molecules of NAD will not be able to be recycled, and therefore, at a certain point, the available NAD plus that will drive glycolysis is going to go down, and therefore stop the reactions. This is where fermentation comes into place. In fermentation, microbes are not going to use the electron transport chain to recycle NADH to NAD plus. Here's when fermentation comes into play. Fermentation is going to be able to reduce NADH to NAD+, which can now be used again during glycolysis. When you have, as you learn in Bio 110, the lactic acid fermentation, you take a molecule of pyruvate and the enzyme lactase dehydrogenase is able to now reduce NADH to NAD+, generating two lactase molecules. That recycles the NAD plus that it can now help drive glycolysis. In an analogous fashion in yeast cells, what you have now is the process of fermentation that is going to generate alcohol and carbon dioxide. Like you learn in Bio 110, those two pyruvate molecules are going to be decarboxylated by pyruvate decarboxylase, generating two acetaldehydes. There is where the gas gets formed during fermentation by yeast. Now, acetaldehyde is going to be uh, dehydrogenated by alcohol dehydrogenase to generate ethanol. And here, the electrons are going to be donated from NADH to acetaldehyde, and now you have the recycling of two NAD pluses, which can now drive glycolysis back. What we're going to learn is that alcohol and lactic acids are not the only type of fermentation. We're going to see propionic acid being fermented from lactose. We're going to see the process of mixed acid fermentation, where a sugar molecule is going to be fermented into ethanol, 2,3-butanediol, succinate, lactate, acetate, formate, hydrogen gas, and carbon dioxide. You can also have butyric acid fermentation, when hexose is going to then be fermented into butyrate, hydrogen gas, carbon dioxide, and protons. Butanol fermentation is going to take sugars and generate butanol, acetone, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen gas. And the caprate butyrate fermentation will take ethanol and acetate to generate butyrate, caprate, hydrogen gas, water, and protons. Last, you have acetogenic fermentation, which can take fructose and generate acetate. These are going to be generated by multiple different microorganisms. Notice that yeast cells are not the only cells capable of generating like ethanol and CO2. I want to point to you Zymomonas mobilis, which is a bacteria that is able to ferment 
sugar into ethanol and carbon dioxide. And they have a high content of hopanoids in their membranes, which are able then to help them tolerate ethanol and therefore be useful in the generation of, for example, the Mexican pulque, which is an alcoholic drink, and also the generation of very yummy tequila and mezcal. But sugars are not the only molecules that could be fermented. Acetylene could be fermented, glycerol could be fermented, resorcitol, which is this aromatic compound here in the left, fluoroglucinol, another aromatic compound, could be fermented, putrescine, the product of the fermentation of amino acids um, by gram positive aerobes, could be fermented, citrate, aconitate, glyoxylate, and benzoate. All molecules can eventually be fermented and generate products and these microorganisms are able then to do substrate level phosphorylation, harvest energy. So not only sugars, but multiple different compounds could be fermented. When we look, for example, now at Clostridia, which are firmicutes, um, all gram-positive microorganisms that are anaerobic and live in soil, they're able to, for example, ferment carbohydrates from cellulose, sugars or starches, as well as pentoses. They will, depending on the fermentation process that they're getting, they are going to able to then have different products. But they can also ferment amino acids. And the amino acids, when fermented, can give rise to other kinds of fatty acids, ammonia, as well as CO2. There are also some are able to ferment purines, which are going to give you uric acid and other pu purines to form acetic acid, carbon dioxide, and ammonia. So any molecule that we have studied so far in class could be the substrate used in fermentation by some kind of microorganisms and oxygenically to derive energy. So one of the things that I want to look more carefully is the lactic acid fermentation in bacteria. So we're going to see that most lactic acid bacteria are gram-positive microorganisms, mostly area-tolerant anaerobes, and they're going to generate lactic acid in the process of sugars. Lactic acid can be broken down into two different fermentative processes. The homofermentative process is only going to generate lactic acid, and the heterofermentative process, which is going to generate lactic acid, ethanol, and carbon dioxide. So here we go. That's sort of the, type, the two different types of fermentation that are going to generate lactic acid, the homofermentative as the heterofermentative. Now, let's take a look at these two different pathways more carefully. Homofermentative bacteria are going to be able to metabolize glucose through glycolysis. And they have, as you know, the enzyme aldolase that are going to generate glyceraldehyde triphosphate and dihydrogen acetone phosphate. Eventually, when the enzyme thiosphosphatase isomerase converts dihydroacetone phosphate into glyceraldehyde triphosphate, those molecules will go through the glycolysis process to generate pyruvate. Here is when you have now the generation of NADH from the reaction of glyceraldehyde triphosphate to 1,3-bisphosphoglyceric acid. During homolactic fermentation, pyruvate will be converted into lactate mediated by the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase, and there is where you have the recycling of NADH to NAD+. This kind of fermentation is going to generate two ATP molecules from the fermentation of glucose. Now, heterofermentative bacteria do not use glycolysis. They are going to use what is considered the phosphoketolase pathway. And this pathway takes advantage of merging the initial steps of the pentose phosphos pathway with the generation of ribulose 5-phosphate. So let's look at this more carefully. So as a glucose molecule gets transported across the membrane, it's going to come phosphorylated into glucose 6-phosphate. Now, in the initial step of the pentose phosphate pathway, glucose 6-phosphate is going to donate electrons to NAD+, 
generating NADH, and 6-phosphogluconic acid. Now, 6-phosphogluconic acid is going to donate electrons to NAD+, to generate NADH and ribulose 5-phosphate, and there's also going to be a decarboxylation event that goes from a 6-carbon molecule to a 5-carbon sugar and a CO2 molecule. Now, ribulose 5-phosphate will be isomerized to cellulose 5-phosphate. This is where pentoses, for example, that are transported across the bacteria are going to be able to come in as well. And here is when we have the enzyme phosphoketolase. The enzyme phosphoketolase is able to take a phosphate and basically split the 5-carbon cellulose 5-phosphate into two molecules. One of them, acetyl phosphate. Acetyl phosphate has two carbons and glyceraldehyde triphosphate, which has three carbons. Now, glyceraldehyde triphosphate is able to go down eventually and generate pyruvate using the same enzymes that are present in the glycolytic pathway. Here is where you're going to have the formation of another NAD plus molecule from glyceraldehyde triphosphate to 1,3-bisphosphoglyceric acid. The pyruvate generated in this reaction is going to be the substrate of the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase to generate lactate, and here the electron from NADH will be uh, donated to generate NAD+. Here's the first recycling of NADH to NAD+. Now, on the other branch, it's going to have the substrate acetyl phosphate. Acetyl phosphate, it's going to accept electrons and become acetaldehyde. And here is now the first utilization of NADH to NAD+. Acetaldehyde, however, it's going to um, be reduced and form ethanol, and the enzyme ethanol dehydrogenase is going to mediate the reaction. And here is the recycling now of the second NADH molecule to generate NAD+. Though during the fermentation of glycolysis, you get two lactate molecules and you net gain two ATP by the pentose phosphate pathway, you're going to only gain one ATP and have the products of glucose be converted into one lactate, one ethanol, and one carbon dioxide molecule. Bacteria that are present in the guts of many animals are going to be in what we call enteric bacteria. E. coli is one of the examples of this. They're gram-negative rods, they do not form spores, and most of them are facultative aerobes. A lot of them are human pathogens. E. coli could be a human pathogen. Shigella, Salmonella, Yersinia, and Vibrio, all of them are human pathogens. These are fermentative bacteria in anaerobic conditions, and they are going to use two major pathways of fermentation, the mixed acid fermentation and the 2,3-butanidiol fermentation. Let's take a look at these pathways more closely. During the mixed acid fermentation, which is conducted by E. coli, Glucose is going to be converted to pyruvate through glycolysis. Now, pyruvate is going to be broken down into two molecules, acetyl-CoA and formate. Formate is a one-carbon molecule. Acetyl-CoA has two carbon molecules. Pyruvate could also be fermented directly to lactate. And through a process using the enzymes from the Krebs cycle, pyruvate can be converted into succinate. So that's one of the acids. Lactate is another of the acids. Formic can further be converted into hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide. And acetyl-CoA would eventually become ethanol or acetate. So during the mixed acid fermentation, you're going to form three acids, acetic acid, lactic acid, and succinic acid. No butanidiol is going to be formed. And you're going to have the formation of carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas to a one-to-one -one ratio. This is coming from the formate uh, fermentation. So you have four acidic molecules, the lactate, succinate, formate, and acetate, generated for every neutral molecule, in this case, ethanol. So let's take a closer look at the mixed acid fermentation in E. coli. As we discussed before, Glucose will be transported across the membrane through the glucose PTS system, generating glucose 6-phosphate. Through glycolysis, you're going to have two uh, phosphoenol pyruvates. One of them, again, will be able to be used to bring more glucose in. The other one can be converted to pyruvate. Both 
phosphoenyl pyruvate may also be converted to pyruvate, and one of them could be fermented into lactate. But it could also be fermented into formate and acetyl-CoA. The formate is eventually um, broken down into carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas. The acetyl-CoA eventually become acetyl phosphate, which can generate acetate. Phosphoenyl pyruvate eventually can go through reverse reactions in the citric acid cycle to oxaloacetate, malate, fumarate, and eventually succinate. As you can see, I have marked in the purple arrows all the steps that are going to take NADH and convert it into NAD+. So you have one here during oxaloacetate to malate, and another one from fumarate to succinate. You also have the reaction, as we discussed before, of pyruvate to lactate, that is going to get, get us an NAD+, and as well as acetyl-CoA to acetaldehyde and acetaldehyde to ethanol. That's another one over here. Acetyl phosphate, it's able to donate its phosphate to ADP to generate ATP when you generate acetic acid. So you're going to get carbon dioxide from formate being broken down into carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And you can also use now a carbon dioxide from 2-phosphoenol pyruvate to generate oxaloacetate. So take a look at the mixed acid fermentation, follow the arrows closely, look where the NADHs are going to be recycled, um, and try to figure out where it is advantageous for any coli uh, cell to be able to ferment and recycle its NAD plus into NADH that can further drive glycolysis. Now, the other enteric bacteria are going to ferment butanidiol and Enterobacter and Klebsiella are two example organisms that are going to do this. They are going to take glucose again through glycolysis and generate pyruvate, but the final products are going to be different. So you're going to have ethanol, lactate, succinate, acetate, and carbon dioxide and hydrogen, and those are coming from formate as we've shown before. But 2,3-butanidiol and carbon dioxide are also going to be made. And here, for every molecule, you're going to get two carbon dioxides from butanidiol. So, whereas you have now one lactate molecule, you can have butanidiol, ethanol, and all those are going to be more neutral. So you have, for every acidic molecule, you have six neutral molecules. And the rate of carbon dioxide to hydrogen is going to be five to one. So you're going to have five carbon dioxide molecules per molecule of hydrogen being produced. So a lot, very little acid is produced during the glutenadiol fermentation, and the main products are going to be butanidiol, ethanol, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen gas. So look at the differences. Now let's take a look more carefully at this pathway as shown over here. So in the initial pathway, you're going to have glucose converted into pyruvate. Here you generate two NADH molecules and two ATPs. Now, from pyruvate, you can generate the acids, lactate, formate, succinate, and ethanol. And formate by forming dehydrogenase can become hydrogen gas and CO2. But we can take pyruvate and have the byproduct thiamine pyrophosphate, TPP, and that can mediate the decarboxylation of pyruvate to generate this TPP intermediate. And with another pyruvate molecule, you can combine these two into alpha acetolactate. You can then have a decarboxylation of alpha acetolactate, there goes the CO2, and you can generate the intermediate acetoin. Now, NADH is going to be donating electrons to form 2,3-butanidiol. So here is where the CO2 molecules are going to be coming. So the overall reaction from pyruvate is that for two pyruvate molecules and one NADH, you're going to generate two CO2 molecules and one butanidiol. So as we've seen, sugars that are coming transported by the PTS systems in microorganisms are going to be phosphorylated into, for example, glucose 6-phosphate, 
and depending on the pathway they're going to generate pyruvate at different rates therefore pyruvate could be fermented into some other kind of carbon molecule lactic acid ethanol acetate but glycolysis is not the only way and glucose is not the only molecule that is being given to a cell to make atp it requires the production of energy rich compounds and those are going to be the compounds that are going to drive the generation of ATP from ADP and a phosphate. So the cell is going to get a lot of this energy-rich intermediates from different fermentative metabolisms, and that is what I want to show you right now. This complicated image, what it's showing you are all the potential molecules that are coming inside the cell, and the pathway it's now showing you in blue the molecules which are called the high energy rich compounds. So some of those high rich energy compounds are going to be linked to coenzyme A, or some of them are going to be phosphorylated. So we have both of them in here. What I have done is that I have combined the data from table 13.1, and those, are, those numbers that are shown in purple are the delta G naught of the hydrolysis of that phosphorylated or acetyl-CoA bound molecule in kilocals per mole. So remember, when you hydrolyze an ATP molecule into ADP and PI, you're going to generate 31.8 kilojoules per mole. So to make an ATP, you require 31.8 kilojoules per mole. So let's take an example to look at this. And the ones that I have gotten here are the ones that I could find in the table. So I'm not looking at them once with amino acids for, for example, propionyl phosphate or 2-alkyl acetyl phosphate or 2-aryl acetyl phosphate. I think glycolysis, glyceraldehyde 1,3-diphosphate. When it's hydrolyzed to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, it can generate an ATP. Why? Because the delta G of hydrolysis of glyceraldehyde 1,3-phosphate is minus 51.9 kilojoules per mole. That is greater than the 31.8 kilojoules per mole needed to make an ATP. Phosphoenol pyruvate. When it becomes pyruvate, the, the delta G of hydrolysis is 51.6 negative 8 uh, kilojoules per mole. That is more than the 31.8 kilojoules per mole needed to make an ATP molecule. So through substrate level phosphorylation, glyceraldehyde 1, 3 bisphosphate or phosphoenol pyruvate are able to generate ATP. But take a look now at acetyl phosphate. The delta G of hydrolysis of acetyl phosphate is 44.8, minus 44.8. That is sufficient to generate an ATP when the acetyl phosphate donate that phosphate to ADP to generate acetate. It is the same for butyryl phosphate, which has a minus 44.8 kilocal per joule when it generates butyrate or carbamyl phosphate to generate CO2 that has a minus 39.3 kilojoules per mole. So the generation through substrate level phosphorylation of this high energy rich compounds allow the fermentative microorganism to harvest ATP when those high energy molecules donate that phosphate to ADP. Another example of this, it's the fermentation of amino acids in Clostridium using the Strickland reaction. Now, the Strickland reaction is a fascinating reaction when two amino acids are going to be fermented and through donation of electrons, they are going to generate ATP. Let's take a look at an example of the Strickland reaction where you have two amino acids. For the Strickland reaction to work, one amino acid has to donate electrons, and the other amino acid has to accept the electrons. So in this particular example, you're going to have alanine being the oxidative amino acid, the one that is going to donate electrons, and you have glycine, which is going to be the amino acid pair that is going to receive the electrons. So we begin this reaction by the oxidation of alanine. NAD plus is going to catch the electron donated by alanine, and that reaction is also a deamination reaction, generating pyruvate and an ammonia molecule. You also have the generation of NADH. Now, pyruvate with CoA and the decarboxylation 
it's going to generate acetyl CoA. And in this second reaction, you're also going to have an electron donated from pyruvate to generate, and that the electron is going to be catched by NAD plus to generate NADH. So now you have two NADH molecules. Recycling of NADH happens with the reduction of glycine. So you're going to have two NADH produced with the oxidation of alanine, and now one of those NADH and a phosphate are going to be passed to one glycine molecule. Glycine will be deaminated in the process to generate one acetyl phosphate. That reaction is repeated two times, and therefore you generate two acetyl phosphate. At the end, from the oxidation of alanine to acetyl CoA, you're going to eventually have the phosphorylation of acetyl CoA and the removal of the CoA molecule to generate an acetyl phosphate. Now you have three acetyl phosphate molecules present and they have sufficient energy to generate an ATP each. So you have three ATP molecules generated and the formation of three acetate molecules. So now the overall reaction from one alanine and two glycines and two water molecules, you're going to generate three acetate molecules, a carbon dioxide, three ammonia, and three ATP. The overall delta G prime naught of the reaction is minus 186 kilojoules. The Strickland reaction can be used to um, in redox oxidation and fermentation of multiple amino acids. Leucine will be uh, oxidized while proline will be reduced. Isoleucine will be oxidized while hydroxyproline will be reduced. Valine could be oxidized while tryptophan can be reduced and histidine could be oxidized while arginine is going to be reduced. And you will have different uh, molecules being generated at the end with different amounts of ATP. So the amino acids participating in the couple strict length reaction fermentations will generate ATP for the cell. So excretion of fermentation products which reduces the substance produced during the fermentation process, that is going to maintain the redox balance. So the excretion of those fermentation products. For example, hydrogen could be produced either by the ferroxine pathway or the format pathway, and that is going to be one fermentation product that can then continue driving fermentation forward. Acetate or other kind of fatty acid also will be produced, and at this point, you can have production of ATP. So for example, let's take a look at pyruvate, which as you know has the carbon molecule, and pyruvate with a CoA molecule and with the enzyme acetate format lias, it's going to generate acetyl-CoA and formate. Acetyl-CoA with different reactions eventually will form acetate and ATP. Now formate, it's going to be broken down into carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas by the enzyme formate hydrogen lyase. Protons from pyruvate can be donated to ferrodoxin, and now ferrodoxin by the enzyme hydrogenase can produce hydrogen gas. Or you can go from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA and carbon dioxide. Acetyl-CoA, it's going to be phosphorylated to generate acetyl phosphate and the coenzyme A, and here with ADP you can generate acetate and ATP. So what we have is the phosphoroclastic reactions and by different uh, enzymatic steps that we're not showing, you generate acetate and ATP. So just to remind you, a phosphoroclastic reaction involves the cleavage of a carbon-carbon bond that involves the phosphate transfer but not as in phosphorolysis, directly to one of the products. So for example, the decomposition of pyruvate to acetate and carbon dioxide is a phosphoroclastic reaction. And here, the phosphate is added to ADP to form ATP and not to another byproduct. So what do we do with the hydrogen that is formed during the fermentative reactions? So in an oxy-decomposition, synthropy, is going to be the mechanism in which the hydrogen gas is removed to maintain a low level of hydrogen and therefore continue driving the 
fermentative reaction forwards, and that is going to be removed through the process of methanogenesis. So we're going to have synthropy as a metabolic cooperation. You're going to have two organisms that are going to cooperate to metabolize a substance that neither of them can degrade alone. Most syntrophic reactions are secondary fermentations. One organism is going to take the product of the fermentation of another and use it. And all of them usually involves the fermentation of a fatty acid and an alcohol. So let's take an example. When you have, during decomposition, a complex polymer like cellulose that is going to be hydrolyzed into a sugar, and that sugar eventually is going to be fermented into some kind of compound, like in mixed acid fermentation, to generate, for example, acetate and formate, formate is going to eventually be generating a carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas. Now here, that hydrogen gas is going to be taken by methanogens, and through methanogenesis, it's going to be uh, used to form methane. So you have removed the hydrogen gas out of the system and therefore continue removing one of the products so the reactions continue moving forward. Let me show you now as an example with the reactions directly and the delta Gs that you will have. So for example, during ethanol fermentation, you're going to have two ethanol molecules and two water molecules, and that will generate a acetate molecule, four hydrogen, and two protons. As you can see, the delta G naught prime of this reaction is a positive 19.4 kilojoules per reaction. That reaction alone, it's endergonic and therefore non-favorable. Now, methanogenesis, on the other hand, where you have four hydrogen gas, one carbon dioxide to generate an methane and two water molecules is a very extragonic reaction with a delta G of minus 130.7 kilojoules per mole. When you put them together, in the case of meth ethanol plus CO2 going into um, methane and acetate and protons, now the delta G of those combined coupled reactions is minus 111.3 kilojoules per reaction. So as the reactions are coupled, the energy requirements of one reaction are satisfied by the energy production of the other. But here, these reactions are happening in two different organisms, and you now have the transfer of the hydrogen from one reaction to the other organism in a different reaction. So this reaction happens when the hydrogen that is removed from the fermentation of ethanol to acetate, it's now being used by the methanogen producing organisms. So the methanogen organisms are keeping the concentration of hydrogen so low that it drives the fermentation of ethanol to acetate. That reduces the amount of hydrogen present to nearly zero concentration and therefore helps drive the delta G of ethanol fermentation to a negative value, making it favorable. It's not delta G naught. Remember, delta G naught is some reactions that are happening under standard conditions. So the reactions happening in the communal reactions are not delta G naught reactions. They're just delta Gs. And because of that, this is why synthropy allows the fermentation of hydrogen gas by methanogens to aid the fermentation of ethanol to acetate. So with this, I'm going to stop the lecture. Notice that we use fermentation in many different mechanisms, and we have used it for many hundreds of years to preserve food, to produce now uh, delicious beer and wine and cheese and pickles and olives, etc., etc. But we want to also take advantage of this reaction to produce biofuels. And with that, I'm going to stop the lecture. Thank you very much. See you on Tuesday.